we get so busy, and some of the things, you know, we have to do. Um, it's always easier for somebody else to tell you to slow down than it is for you to resist the urge to slap them. <laughs> However, man, prioritizing some rest is important. And we've all been there. And I'm there a lot. And I have this thing, Melody and I are a lot alike. It's like, it's very difficult to just put something off. Got to do it, got to do it. We all need rest. God designed us to need rest. And I'm going to talk a lot about rest this morning, but not so much the kind of rest that we saw there, not so much just simply physical rest. I mean, that's important. We have to maintain a healthy balance. We need to take time out just to be in God's presence, right? We, we have nothing urgent. We're not coming to him in a, in a panic. We're not coming to him in a crisis. We, we shouldn't be coming to him because we feel we have to, but that there is a time just to be refreshed in his presence. You know, God designed us that way. He instituted a Sabbath. And while we are in the new, new covenant, the principle of Sabbath is still important. When we stop producing and simply refresh. But there's another kind of rest that believers in Christ need to understand. Now, I'm, I'm preaching to believers in Christ this morning. If you're not a believer in Christ, you're welcome to listen in. But this is especially for those who have made a confession of Christ, and they are seeking to live for Him. There's parts of this rest that I'm going to talk about that seem out of reach. And here's when it's out of reach. Rest is unattainable to the one who is working hard to be righteous. Rest is unattainable to the one who is working hard to be righteous. And I, I tell you what, folks, it is on steroids in central Pennsylvania. This whole working for God's approval, working to be righteous. There are people in churches all over central Pennsylvania today who, who in their mind have not yet quite figured out the difference between the Old Testament and the New. There are people sitting in orange-colored pews and other kind of pews today. They're sitting on chairs or benches or whatever it may be who still have this mindset that, that God's keeping a list of do's and don'ts. And as long as they are working hard to keep those lists, they're in good shape. There are people in church, not just in central Pennsylvania today, but all over the world who have this in their mind that, well, what did Jesus really do? I don't quite understand. It's true. I've been around. Used to travel on the road for almost 30 years, and I just can't tell you how many times people have said, well, I've, I've been a good Assembly of God person for 49 years, or I've been a good Methodist all my life, or I've been a Baptist all my life, or I was born a Mennonite, and I'm going to die a Mennonite. And there's something in that tone that tells me, you're missing something. You're not at rest. There are people who have not found rest in Jesus Christ. People do it every day. They do it all over the place, all over Shippensburg today. Some people are in churches, some people aren't. But they're working hard to try to prove to themselves and to God and to others that they deserve the blessing of God because of what they do and don't do. And it is a vicious cycle. And you will go through your whole life just afraid that somehow you're going to miss heaven because you didn't do enough or you didn't not do enough. Lots of people are trying to be good, and lots of people are trying not to be bad. And they think that's the Christian life. 
They think that's all there is to it. It's working hard to keep a code. Working hard to not get caught saying the wrong thing. Not get caught doing the wrong thing. Especially in church. There are people doing everything they can today to avoid Jesus. Because they think they found a better way. And not all of them are outside of the church. Life of faith, you know, it's just not complex enough. We've got to add some more hoops to it. If I can't see it, it doesn't exist. And therefore, I've got to have something I can see. You know what it is when you worship something you can see? It's called idolatry. It's frustrating. It's frustrating to be in that position and to try to just always be thinking, I I just haven't quite done enough. If I can just change the way I react, if I can just change the way I talk, if I can just change the habits that I have, if I can just look more holy, if I can just look as holy as Gene, if I can speak as pure as Terry, if I can just, and there's this anxiousness And it's anything but rest. Some people have grown up all their lives in church and have never heard anything about resting in Jesus. And because of that, I have to believe that some people have never read the New Testament. You can go to church every week and have very little biblical knowledge. And it's one of the greatest tools of our enemy. Just, just be good and just show up in church. Don't, you don't have to read that thing. That's, that's for professional clergy. It's a, the last effects of this cultural Christianity that is quickly dying. And that's a good thing. This whole show up in the building and everything's okay as long as you watch what you say. As long as other people see you doing it. As long as you don't do what they do. Instead of working from a place of rest, they have deluded themselves into thinking that they can work toward a place of rest. God designed us to work from a place of rest. Working for Jesus is good. Physical labor is good. Working and producing and and all of these things is good. When I say coming from a place of rest, that's not saying sit around and do nothing. It's the attitude in which you do what you do, and that's the importance. If you work from a place of rest in Christ, then you're working for his honor and glory. You're not working for you to somehow gain approval before a holy God who loves you. There's not a thing you can do to make God love you more. And there's not a thing you can do to make God love you less. The love of God is not in question. He doesn't love you because you're lovable. Can we say amen? Amen. (laughs) He loves us because he's love. It's, It's who he is. Book of Hebrews, man, puts this in perspective. Book of Hebrews is a great book. It's it's a link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I don't know if some of you here might have grown up, maybe you're Jewish, maybe you grew up in a Jewish household. There's not too many in this part of the country. But for those of us who did not grow up Jewish, a lot of times we, we need some help understanding the Old Testament. Am I right? We read the first five books, and we read all about law and and about all of the the multi-layered rules and laws. And we look at that, and we go, oh, my goodness. But when you understand that they were only pointing to Christ and that Christ has fulfilled most of the law, when you understand that the Jewish leaders, they complicated things because it was like, okay, we've got all these laws, but 
I, I just not keeping enough of them, so I think we'll make some more. And that way, when we keep them, we can feel a whole lot better about ourselves. That's that rule-keeping trap. That if I just follow the rules, then somehow I'll be holy. Well, the law never intended to save. The law pointed to sin and ultimately the need for a Savior. And when we read the book of Hebrews, we, we get a better picture of this. It's a great study. I tell people when they're just getting used to, to reading the Bible, start with the Gospel of John, the fourth book in the New Testament, because it, it speaks of Jesus being fully God and fully man. It talks about the love of God, that he loved the world so much that he gave his very best. And then I say, suggest, you know, maybe then you want to move to the book of Acts and read about the history of the first 30 years of the history of the church and see God at move, huh? It's called kind of the Acts of the Apostles. I like to call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit because that's really what it is. The Holy Spirit used ordinary men and women to, to do his, his service, and he still empowers people today. And then generally I will say, then go to Hebrews to understand the role that Jesus has. He is our great high priest, but he's also our great apostle. He's the great messenger. And it gives parallels between the new and the old. It gives parallels between Jesus and, and Moses and Abraham and, and those who lived and died in faith. And it says that God's always been after the heart of man. But the only way the heart can be cleansed and be changed is through Jesus. It's kind of a, Hebrews is like cliff notes for Gentiles, you know. <laughs> By the way, there's an elephant in the room. Actually, there's 200 in the room because everybody needs a little Jesus. <laughs> so... Take, take one or a couple with you. I think there's 200 somewhere, you know. You see them hiding all over the place, and this is kind of cool. Who knows? It may open up a conversation. Hey, can I give you this? Because everybody needs a little Jesus, right? <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Anyway, you're probably wondering what they, when they came in, you thought, no, oh, there's dirt on the seat. No, it's a little Jesus. I have a question, though when it comes to this thing. If Jesus has already accomplished on your behalf what you've never been able to accomplish on your own, why would you go back to beating your head against the wall? And that's really what the author of the book of Hebrews is saying. Written to, who do you think the book of Hebrews was written to? Hmm? The Jews, Hebrews. Yeah, in the name. I wasn't trying to trick you. And primarily Christian Jews. And perhaps even uh, Jews who became Jews that weren't born Jews. Proselytes. And just not too far into this whole experience of Christ crucified, resurrected, and ascended, and the Holy Spirit being sent, a lot of them were just starting to want to drift back into comfort. Because this whole Jesus thing was new. I mean, there was no King James Bible. There was no any kind of Bible yet, except for the Old Testament. And they were trying to wrap their heads around this, this idea that Christ fulfilled the law and that in Christ we can have rest and we can be assured of our salvation. And a lot of them were thinking, this doesn't seem difficult enough. I think I'm going to go back to what I already know. Boy, that keeps a lot of people from Jesus. And we have it in our, in our world today. We've got these, these things that aren't in the Bible, but a lot of people think they are. Like what a church service should look like. Down to the songs and the temperature and whether you sing off the wall or out of the book and what translation of the Bible you use and what you wear and what you sit on. More people know that kind of stuff than they do what's in the Word of God. Amen. So here we have a situation when Hebrews was written. He had a group of people who were kind of thinking, you know what, I, I, this is a little too new for me. I think I just want to go back to my old-time religion. And the author of Hebrews was saying, no, 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 you can't. You can't go back. There's no hope in going back. It's Jesus. 
from the, from the foundation of the world, God had Jesus in mind. Still, people like to beat their head against the wall, not because they enjoy it, but because they've always done it. I wish y'all could have met my dad. He had sayings, lots of sayings. And he said, you know, there's one good thing about beating your head against the wall. It feels so good when you quit. <laughs> but sometimes if it's all you know, and, and, and uh, maybe you think you deserve to beat your head against the wall. Because after all, how could God forgive me? I'm not worth anything. And we miss our value. We miss the value that God sees in us if we're in Christ. And so we never rest. We're always in turmoil. We're always trying to figure out what more thing can I do to gain God's approval. And he said, listen, I approve of you because I see the blood of my son. And we try to work to gain God's approval. And he says, I have no problem with you working, but let's work for the right things. Let's work from a position of rest. Rest in me. Understand who I have made you to be. Hebrews 1, verse 3, the end of verse 3 says, After making purification for sins, he sat down, speaking of Jesus, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus sat down. You know what that means? Does it mean he was tired? No, it means he was done. He was complete. The, the plan was complete. He sat down. He sat down because there was nothing else to do. And we see that all through the book of Hebrews. If Jesus, the only one who had the currency to pay the price of sin, has completed his work, has paid for your sin with his blood, has defeated death by rising again, and is currently seated with God at his right hand, are you still trying to work your way into God's favor? Worried about making heaven? Talk to so many people through the years. Oh, I just hope I make it. What a way to live. Hebrews, we see Jesus as both messenger and priest. Moses and Aaron. Moses was the one who led the, the nation out of, the, the soon-to-be nation, out of Egypt's slavery. Aaron, his brother, was the high priest. So Moses led, Aaron consecrated. Aaron dealt with the sacramental, with the, the sacrificial system. Aaron, the great high, the, the high priest, was the only one who could go into the most holy place once a year on the Day of Atonement. And he had an awful lot of preparation he had to go through so that he could go in where the Ark of the, the Covenant was. And Jesus fulfilled both roles. He also was the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. Romans 10, 11 says, well, let's do 11 through 13. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. See, under the old covenant, they just did it every day. Can you just imagine the stench and the blood and the guts and the smoke and all of that? I mean, you may like barbecue, but after a while, it would get a little old. And had to do it every day. Why? Because the blood of bulls and goats did not take away sin. Never. Never was it intended to. This is the whole point. God had to set up a system to show the seriousness of sin. Don't misunderstand by saying we rest in Christ and, and misunderstand that sin isn't a serious thing. No. Sin has to be dealt with. Sin separates us from God. But there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to atone for that. It's simply resting in what Jesus did. Verse 12 says, But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. God spoke the world into existence six days, six days of creation, and on the seventh day, he rested. Was he tired? No, it was done. He sat down. <laughs> he rested. He did not get up the next day and start creating the world again. 
it was done. He only created once. He set everything into motion. And how about that? It just keeps going and going and going. It was finished. Jesus, when he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And it didn't mean his life. It meant the plan of salvation. He was dead. He was buried. He defeated death by rising again. And he ascended in his glorified body to heaven. And someday he is coming back for his bride. He sat down. He is sitting today at the right hand of the Father because his work is done. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated. King James says, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Stop trying to earn your way into God's favor. You come to Christ, you can be seated. It's done. And understand the, the, the true rest of God. I want to look today specifically at a passage, Hebrews 4, uh, verses 9 through 11. I encourage you to follow. If you uh, make some notes, you know it's nothing, nothing wrong with making a note in your Bible. Mine are all scribbled in. And if that offends you, then it's probably an issue. If you don't want to, that's fine. But uh, I like making notes and comments and margins and carrots and all these things. And there may be a word or two that you feel you'd like to underline. No matter what that lady who you grew up in church with who looked down her nose at you, it's not illegal to write in the Bible. <laughs> Sometimes you just tell how spiritual people think they are. But you know what? They're insecure. They're working. They're working to become holy. They're working so that you think that they are holier than you. So don't get mad at them. Pray for them. And pray that they find rest in Christ. 9 through 11. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest. That word is sabbatismos. And Sabbath rest, if you look at uh, uh, interlinear Greek comparison, it's actually repeated. In other words, Sabbath rest, it's only one word, and it's that word, sabbatismos, a Sabbath rest, a, a resting from our working to be approved before God. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And we'll walk through this a little bit, but let me just give you a little background. Something you can do in your own time. If you like to read Hebrews 3 and 4, you're going to get a bigger picture of what this resting is all about. And the author of Hebrews gives examples of where God's people have failed in the past. And the whole thrust of this is looking back to those who have failed, don't you fail. Uh, looking back to those who never entered the rest that God intended for them, make sure you don't miss it either. And he goes and tells stories about Moses as he led Israel through the desert. You know, we, we, we know the, the cloud by day and the fire by night. That's kind of a type of Christ. That, that cloud and that fire was leading the people through the wilderness. Moses even has been called a type of Christ because he led them out of bondage. And Jesus leads us out of the bondage of sin. And we know they spent 40 years in the wilderness, but they didn't have to. They went to Sinai. Gave, God gave the law, the Ten Commandments. Uh, they went over to uh, uh, the, uh, when they had the 12 spies to go into uh, Kadesh Barnea, and they had their chance to go in there. That was about two years into their journey. Ten of the spies said, oh, man, the land looks great, but the giants, we can't handle them. And only two people, Joshua and Caleb, said they could go. 
they did not rest in what God has promised. And because of that, they spent the next 38 years wandering in the wilderness. Only two, Caleb and Joshua, were able to enter into the promised land. There was all kinds of rebellions, seven of them, actually, in the time that they wandered through the wilderness. A lot of it had to do with uh, uh, who, who made you boss, he'd say to Moses, right? Even his own sister accused him at one time, he and his brother Aaron. And there were, there were all kinds of troubles and disobedience, and the children of Israel got upset because they're tired of eating this manna. And they forget all the bad things. And let's just go back to beating our head against the wall. Let's just go back to, to Egypt because there at least we had something to eat. Of course, they worked nonstop. But they forgot that. They figured they had a better way than God. See, it was unbelief. It was unbelief that kept them from entering the rest that God had for them. We can even go back to creation and look that, that God created everything everything that mankind would need. And he put Adam and Eve in the garden. And he, he had to give them a choice to disobey or else they would not have had free will. He created them in his image. He created us higher than the animals so that we could make our own decisions because he wanted us to love him of our own free will. And mankind messed up, chose wrong. But you know, I, I don't think God ever intended us for us to, to work and slave and grovel and strive and, and fight to just make a living to put food on the table. He didn't create us that way. But we just like beating our head against the wall too much. So then we move ahead and we think about uh, uh, the, the, the rebellions, you know, the time in the desert, tired of this manna, there's nothing to drink. Then there's nothing to worship. They couldn't even let Moses get down off the mountain at Sinai with the Ten Commandments before they, you know, made a calf and Aaron let them do it. We need something to worship. Well, we want to be like the other nations. Well, we'd rather beat our heads against the wall than to just take the rest that God is planning for us. Even when Joshua led them into the promised land in Jericho, it didn't take long before they turned around and rebelled and said, no, we're not going to do it God's way. We're going to do it our way. It says here that the people of God, the people of God, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And speaking of Sabbath, a Sabbath is an important thing even today. But if we're going to get technical and we're going to obey that, then we should do it on Saturday. I don't think we should. I don't believe we're under that. Our life should be a, a, an understanding of the rest that we have in Christ. The Sabbath is, is fulfilled when a believer trusts in God and believes him and takes him at his word. That should be a continual seven-day-a-week kind of a thing. It's fine to set apart a day of the week. Mine is Friday, and usually I don't come in here for more than an hour, and that's doing pretty good. But I do carve out those times because you need a Sabbath rest. But this is speaking of something more than just a day of the week. This is more than law. This is, this is New Testament. This is New Covenant. And the author is here saying there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. People of God could be Jew, Gentile, everybody who is, is coming to God through Jesus Christ. And the author here says there remains. Some people think that means heaven. I don't think it's talking about heaven. I believe it speaks of our life here and how we approach each day. That we are not striving to earn favor before God. We're not trying to keep this rule or that rule, hoping that somehow we'll be righteous enough to stand before him. No, no. The Sabbath rest is understanding that there's no amount of good works we can ever do that's going to make us righteous enough to stand before a holy God. It's only in Christ that we stand before him. Only in Christ. God always intended rest. Not laziness. Not slothfulness. But rest. Rest. Work is good, but work from a position of rest, not the other way around. 
Rest comes first. Rest comes first. There's one reason why many Christians are not producing fruit. When we uh, think about John 15, Jesus, uh, his words about abiding in the vine, that as we abide in him and, and let him prune us and shape us and make us into the people he wants us to be, we, we have fruit in that kind of a relationship. And the fruit is evident in our lives. It doesn't come from our labor. It comes from abiding. Galatians 5, 23 and 24 gives us the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Do you ever stop to think that that fruit is for somebody else's consumption? Did you ever think that we abide in the vine and we produce fruit and we don't eat the fruit? It's for other people. That's why we need the church. It's not optional. We need to be together. We need to connect with other believers. Anything less is selfish. Now, I understand there are people that can't physically get to a church service. That isn't what I'm talking about. I mean the church. I mean all true believers in Jesus Christ producing for the sake of one another and consuming what the others have produced. We need the church. Lone Ranger Christianity is not a thing. It's just not. If you're not connected with other believers, you're not part of the church. We produce fruit for others, so sit down. <laughs> Stay grafted, huh? Abide in the vine. Here today, I, I just want you to understand what God has already accomplished on your behalf. I'm going to say that again. What God has already accomplished on your behalf. Because we don't have to beg God for what he's already said he's given us. And I hear it all the time. Oh, God, please be with us. Oh, God, please, please uh, show us your character and nature. Oh, God, please help us. Oh, God, please. And he's like, I already did. I already did. What are you striving about? Just enter into this rest, this assurance that he has already provided these things. When, when you give your, give your life to Jesus, you understand that it's by faith. We say, I can't do any of this on my own. My good works aren't working. Uh, my life is, is just out of control. I know that if I would die today, I would not be in heaven, that I would be where I deserve, and we all deserve, in a, in a Christless eternity in hell. But we come to that point where we say, Lord, I'm going to give you everything I have, and I'm going to trust you to make my life new. And it doesn't always mean that things get perfect. Matter of fact, I don't think it ever does. But he gives us the ability to walk through what we have to walk through. So, so for us to say, I don't think too many people in the church today would think it odd to say that you don't get to see proof of your salvation. Aside from the fact of what you eventually learn as you go through life and think, hey, you know what, the things that held me uh, captive don't hold me captive anymore. The things are starting to break off. That's different. But the moment you do it, oh, there may be an emotional high, but beyond that, you can look in the mirror and you don't look any different. But what we don't see is what's inside and the spirit that God has regenerated that is within you is totally new. We do it by faith, do we not? So why do we get so hung up on the other things? Walking in health. Walking in favor. Receiving the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Why do we get so hung up on the same kind of things that still require faith? Now look, there's a lot about this that I don't understand. But I fully believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he not only made provision for our salvation, he made provision for our healing. He made provision for our sustenance. He made provision for uh, 
being used by the Holy Spirit and giftings that go beyond our natural pay grade. And we strive over these things. And we agonize over some of these things. And he wants us to just rest and walk. If I just pray a little harder, maybe God will heal me. If I just go to church more often, maybe I'll get a better job. All of these things that we add to it, and I'm telling you, there's nothing to add to Calvary. And Hebrews does a great job of speaking of this rest. There's an assurance that we need to have. And, and, and sometimes it's hard because we hear the voices of some people around us who never got free themselves. And, and you hear their voices echoing, well, if you want to make it to heaven, you're going to have to. And they add all this extra stuff on, very little to do with trusting Christ. And, and, and at other times we can blame the enemy of our soul because his battleground is in the mind, right? Listen, we can't earn any of this. We can't make God love or not love us by what we do or don't do. We, we, don't, we don't gain entrance to heaven by and by when I die by keeping the two lists of what to do and what not to do. And if, you know, we get them mastered, we just make some more so we can follow them too. Stop comparing yourself to others. Sit down. Experience the rest that God intends. And we need to stop striving and, and let go of man-made, self-made burdens it's pharisaical. It's pharisaical. It's what the Pharisees did. Read Matthew 23 sometime. I love these people that say, oh, I find the words of Jesus very comforting. You haven't read the words of Jesus sometime. In Matthew 23, he was venting about the, the hypocritical religious crowd. And he said a number of things. In verse 4, he says, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. He said in verse 13 for, to, the, to the Pharisees, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. He calls them blind guides. He says, you strain into the gnat and swallow a camel. And, and I love verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte, and when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you yourselves. What's the solution to living like a Pharisee? <laughs> Sit down. Come to the end of yourself, and you're working for God's acceptance and approval, accept his unconditional love and transformation. You can't make yourself good, but thank God he can. He can create in you a desire to keep that very law that you could never keep on your own. He changes our desires and our priorities, and instead of us having to work so hard because we got to look and see what somebody else is thinking of us, Instead of that, we let God change us into the kind of people that can live for him, that can live above the power of sin, huh? that, that can say, I will not be defeated. I will walk into what God has for me to do. Huh? I will pursue my healing. I will pursue the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life. It's a matter of trusting. It's a matter of believing, and it's a matter of acceptance. And it's all by faith. It's all by faith. And I want to encourage you today to end your struggle to receive a number of things. I told you at first that I was uh, going to speak to believers. Well, let me speak to those maybe who've never made a decision to follow Jesus, that have never been born again. Stop trying to do this on your own. Stop looking for options. There aren't any others. And I know that's not popular in our day of choices. My goodness, you go to the auto parts and there's 14 different layers of brake pads depending on how much you want to pay. We live in a world of choices, especially in this country, right? 
Do you mean Jesus is the only way? Well, is God the only God? <laughs> I think he is. Jesus is the only one to fit the qualifications. He's the only one that lived as a human being, but yet without sin. God in the flesh. You find somebody else who fits those qualifications, and we'll talk. But until then, Jesus is the only way. Stop struggling. Stop struggling over this. Say yes to Jesus. Some of you may be having a struggle today for healing. Healing in your body. And you know what? Sometimes the healing doesn't come, and I understand. But I believe that the potential is always there. Okay? This is a touchy subject because... So many people in the past have said, if you're not healed, you don't have enough faith. But you see, that's pharisaical. Because you're looking down on somebody else, you don't know the whole story. The other, the other extreme, though, is saying, well, if God wants him to be healed, he'll heal me. But if God himself created everything that we see and don't see and then sat down, don't you think when Jesus died on the cross to provide a way for us to be restored to God that he already has done all that needs to be done? Yes. You know, a lot of this has to do with us resting and just simply walking into this. And I want to encourage you today. Will you just walk into your healing? Will you just say, Lord, I don't understand it and I don't have to. I'm, I'm healed. I'm going to trust you for healing in my body. I've also heard stories of people, and some of that's because of church people coming to an altar re, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And, and that's, that's been kind of a corporate thing sometimes where on one side of it, someone's telling you to hang on, and the other side, someone's telling you to let go, and you don't know what to do. Just sit down. Sit down and rest and receive by faith. In our camp, maybe we've, although I believe in the doctrine, but in our camp, perhaps we've majored more on the initial evidence than we have the ongoing fruit of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I do believe that when God baptizes us in his Holy Spirit, I guess doctrinally we could say when God and Jesus baptize us in his Holy Spirit, that he will give us a uh, a prayer language that's something that he can give us and that it's initial evidence but oh we strive over that so much don't just don't but on the other hand for crying out loud open your mouth <laughs> give him honor and praise in what you do understand and let him worry about the rest I, I thank God every day that, that I'm able to, to pray in that language where I, I don't know what I'm saying but God does so many times where I don't know what to pray or how to pray. There's a release there. If I know that I'm speaking heaven's language, I'm a whole lot less likely to think that I am going to mess something up. There's a beauty to that. The Bible says pray in the Spirit and with understanding. And it also says sing in the Spirit and with understanding. We don't hear that too much, but uh, uh, I've heard it sung here, and I've done some of that myself, singing in the Spirit, but but listen, don't, don't, don't struggle over this. We receive it by faith. Freedom from chains. Freedom from addictions. Let me tell you something. This morning, you are not obligated to the flesh. You are not obligated to the flesh. You're not obligated to your mind. You're not obligated to your troubled soul within you. Can I give you permission to ignore that? Because that's what the chains are. It's like an obligation. And I'm not trying to make light of addiction. Not at all. Because I've been around and exposed to, to plenty of folks who struggle. I'm not making light of the struggle. But what I'm saying is at its core, there's an understanding, a faulty understanding that I am obligated to what my flesh is saying. Can I release you from that today in Jesus' name? 
you are not obligated to listen to those voices. I, I give you the right to ignore those voices. I mean, we, we go through our lives, and, and this whole, uh, the American way is I'm my own person, especially out in the western part of the country, rugged individualism, don't tell me what to do, you know, and I think we all get a little of that way sometimes. And, and we won't listen to anybody except our flesh. That we listen to. And then we disguise it. Well, you know, that's just my German blood. I've said that. I try not to say that anymore. That means I'm stubborn. Well, you know, that's just the way I am. Well, well stop being that way then. You don't have to listen to what your flesh is telling you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. You're not obligated to the flesh. I give you permission today to disobey the flesh and the mind and the soul.